This is one of my favorite things in all of ant science. Odds are you've seen something like this before, either here on YouTube or somewhere else on the internet. There are hundreds of videos, some with millions of views, of metal being poured into an ant nest and dug out of the ground. And if you search through eBay, you'll find dozens of these metal casts being sold as art or home decoration. But before these became the things of viral videos in Etsy shops, casting underground ant nests in metal was a scientific method invented by this person, Walter Schinkel. He created the field of ant nest architecture research there you are. and pioneered the methods to do it. It's a beauty, don't you think? He's just published this book, which tells the stories of his discoveries and his research process in this field. So I decided to spend a couple days filming with him down in Tallahassee, Florida. I think more people should know about this corner of science and hear about the story of the invention of nest architecture research and the person who started it. I've never been a person that wanted to be in the center, in the mainstream of science. That's not my nature. I'm, I tend to be on the periphery to look at things that other people aren't looking at. And uh, it's, it's the, the objects and the art that also made ant nest architecture particularly rewarding to me. And, and there, there's the discovery angle, of course, because when you first cast the species, you don't know what's down there. Nest casting was only possible when people figured out what material to pour into the ground that would fill the chamber areas, harden, and then could be dug out of the ground. The first nests weren't metal. Some of the first were this material here, which is dental plaster. A paper was published on using dental plaster for making nest casts, and the authors had done a, a few species, partial casts, they weren't complete casts, and I thought, well, that's a material that would be good. And um, so I bought some dental plaster and made a nest cast of a fire ant nest, and uh, because of its structure, it, it all came out in this big glob of dirt. And then I took it home and washed the soil out, and I was really surprised because it turned out that I hadn't envisioned it right at all, that it was really quite organized in space. And it clearly consisted of, uh, of vertical shafts that connected horizontal chambers. But there were so many of these shaft and chamber units that they melded together. So at that point, I realized that um, nest casting had the potential of showing me stuff that wasn't really easily seen from just excavating a nest. After that first fire ant cast, the second plaster cast Walter ever made became his most famous. It's permanently mounted to okay. a wall in a biology building at Florida State. Are we ready? Yeah. Okay, well, this is the plaster cast that got me hooked on doing uh, nest architecture. It's a Florida harvester ant nest and uh, it is still the biggest one I've ever cast so I guess it was a lucky thing because it, it really did hook me. Besides hooking Walter into doing decades of research, that nest was also the first to get major public attention, debuting with an article and a full page picture in Natural History magazine. So what was impressive was the scale of that thing. I guess that was unexpected it would be so large but also the beauty of it once i saw what the underground chambers were like how they were arranged you know the the helical shaft that connected them and all that i, I saw that that was something really special mounting that cast was a big job there was 180 pieces of plaster plaster nests come out of the ground in pieces like this once glued together and mounted, an assembled cast is fragile, nearly unmovable. So a major step forward in doing this work was figuring out how to melt metals in the field to make casts that can be dug out of the ground in more or less one complete piece. So I was looking for a, a stronger casting material and I fiddled around with a number of things that didn't really work. And I knew eventually I'd have to go to molten metal. So the question is, how do you melt metal in the field, right? Walter's garage workshop is filled with casts and the equipment he's designed and built over the years to do this type of work. Okay, these are a couple of uh, the kilns I made, uh, two sizes. This is probably the smallest one. And this is medium-sized one. I do have one that's bigger than that. They're both built on the same principle of uh, 
of a container that is lined with uh, an insulating material. In this case, it's a, an organic fiber blanket. The blanket is protected by a steel mesh, and inside that is a, is a cage into which the crucible fits. So this is a crucible. It's made from the bottom half of a steel scuba tank and um, put a bucket handle on it. At the bottom, it has a little loop so that once you've pulled it out of the fire, you can hook it and tilt it and pour it. So this fits in there and it takes, well, it takes anywhere from uh, 40 minutes to an hour and a half to, to have a, a bucket full of red hot aluminum. I take the shortcut now. None of these matches and fat lighter. Uh, one of them. Yeah, let's go with that for a while. This is Apalachicola National Forest in northern Florida, where Walter has done most of his field studies. This site, while we're prepping to do a cast of a Campanotus carpenter ant, is his favorite, a place he calls Ant Heaven. For this cast, the metal being used is aluminum. He sourced it from a cut up, failed scuba tank, and after about 90 minutes of heating, fueled by only charcoal and a passive draft chimney, the metal is liquid and hot enough to pour. Okay. The first step is lifting the red hot crucible out of the kiln. Come on, don't do that. There. Once the hook is looped, the crucible is tipped and the contents are poured. Okay, there we go. And if you listen close, you can hear the crackling of the surrounding vegetation as it ignites from the intense heat. That's it, right? No more. After the pour is done, the crucible goes back into the kiln to keep the remaining metal liquid. It'll be poured out later into divots in the sand to create ingots for reusing. Now, we neaten this up. That's good. Once it cools and hardens, digging starts to extract the cast and reveal the shape of the underground nest. Oh my God. It's all the way out here. Yeah, it's good. These are easy to cast because they're such large caliber nests. So there's no problem in herding aluminum down a thin shaft. Yeah, there's still another one. Ah. Got it. There you are. That's a beauty, don't you think? They often have these chambers with the, the holes there because they expand the chamber all the way around. So, Ta -da. All of this is in pursuit of trying to describe and understand the biology of these organisms. Maybe. And the casts themselves present many unanswered questions. This one's different than many because it's so apparently chaotic. So that's, again, remember some of the Fidoli nests were extremely regular and very patterned, and this one is the opposite. So once again, you see, figuring out how uh, relatedness and taxonomy is related, related to architecture is a, is a major challenge and there's no really obvious um, no really obvious uh, answer to it. I was I had made a cast at Ant Heaven where I work and I was I had my head down was digging it out 
Um, wasn't a very deep one, just, you know, Campanot Associates. And all of a sudden I got jerked, um, but my attention was jerked by, there was a guy coming toward me and it was a, a deputy sheriff in his green uniform and his gun and all that. And I thought, oh God, you know, what's he going to challenge me because I'm digging here in the national forest? And no, he said, he wanted to know what I was doing. So I told him, oh, he says, oh, you're the guy. He says, you're the guy with all those metal casts of ants. And I said, yeah, I'm the guy. So he says, hang on, I got to get my cell phone. My kid is going to love this. So he took pictures and videos of me. So yeah, it gets around. So that's the story behind casting ant nests in metal. The rest of the story is in here, along with the over 40 species of ants that Walters made casts of. If you want to learn more about this area, I recommend you check this out.